Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, April 16th, 2019. Now, for those of you in the United States, I hope all of you survived our Monday tax day. It was kind of, how can we make this Monday as terrible as possible? Well, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of things that went on in the world yesterday, including, as was noted at the beginning of yes, at the very end of yesterday's show, that Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire. Um, our hearts go out to everyone in Paris and everyone who has an emotional connection to that amazing piece of architecture and history that truly was the heart of the French Revolution. Um, and we hope to distract you with a bit of science for the next few minutes, at least. And wow, do we have all the science on tap today. Our story starts with a tale of several worlds. In this case, we are looking at the Kepler 47 system. This is a binary star that has not one, not two, but three planets orbiting around those two binary stars in the center. In a new press release, they have announced that one of these worlds is in fact roughly the size of the Earth. Now, here is how the system is described. The orbit of the outer planet of this system falls well within the binary's habitable zone, the region where Earth-like planets could maintain liquid water. The Kepler-47 47 systems worlds are 3.1, 7, and 4.7 times the size of the Earth and take 49, 87, and 303 days to orbit the central binary star, respectively. The stars themselves go around each other every 7.45 days. One of the stars is similar to our own sun, and the other star is one-third the sun's mass, making it a little red dwarf star. Now, before you get too excited, I fully realize I said the world words in the star's habitable zone and earth massed in the same description. Now, the problem is the earth mass star, the earth mass planet, rather, is not the one that's in the habitable zone. It is, in fact, the planet that's 4.7 times the size of the Earth. Um, that's the one, the sub-Neptune, that is doing its best to be in the habitable zone. So what we're looking at is more of an Endor situation than an Earth situation. And we don't know if that sub-Neptune planet has moons yet. Further observations are required but it's still kind of exciting so let's keep watching this system and keeping on watching is something that the neowise mission has been doing one heck of a good job doing back early in my career there was a little space observatory called wise that observed the sky in the infrared the survey telescope was retired in 2003, but stayed on orbit, and later got recommissioned as the NEOWISE mission. And ever since then, five years ago, it has, and I meant to say 2013, not 2003, it was retired in 2013, and uh, five years ago, it was given a new lease on life after being turned off for about two years. And that new life is as a telescope that is surveying the sky over and over again, documenting asteroids like this one. Now, in this particular image that we're looking at, that red splotch is not all asteroid. It is not all comet. It is, in fact, mostly Photoshop. At the core of that red splotch is a little tiny moving point of light that they have highlighted with a giant red splotch so that we could more easily see the asteroid moving through the image. 
in the five years that Neowise has been doing its thing, it has made 95 billion observations. And those are all thanks to a new data release out there waiting to be explored by any and all who have an internet connection and the wherewithal to figure out how to use the data. Um, so welcome to a new era of new data. We have hit big data even with old telescopes, from Gaia dumping more data on our heads than, well, any of us can handle except with database queries, to Neowise, well, following its footsteps and creating its own parallel, less high res, lower cost survey as well. And mission after mission is doing this. This is how science is going to be done in the future. And it's kind of awesome. And with all of this data online, it becomes possible to revisit the science stories of the past and see what new information is waiting in the data as our software gets better and better at processing that data. The Cassini spacecraft plunged in to Saturn, well, a little over a year ago. In fact, I think it's getting on two years ago now. Back in 2017, it made its plunge. And we still have its data, though. It's gigabytes upon gigabytes of data. And with that data, we can go back. Thank you, Rockets Age. Thank you. Um, with that data, we have the capacity to go back and revisit, well, what there is to learn. And what has been learned with this world is it periodically but not always, has amazing hydrocarbon lakes. These are lakes of ethane and methane that exist in Titan's winter. But come summer, just like so many lakes here on the planet Earth, those lakes go away. We are now, by going back and seeing these lakes in the wintertime images, able to go through all the archival data that is now free for anyone to use and look for those images that were taken in the summertime. And that's exactly what planetary scientists have done. And we're now able, thanks to these archives, to see seasonal changes in a moon orbiting another world. Titan, in many ways, is one of the scientists typically most earth process like worlds. And the reason I phrase that so carefully is this is an extraordinarily uh, cold world. It doesn't have a lot of mass. In fact, were us humans in good health to go there with the ability to flap our arms like birds if we attached artificial wings to our arms, we could fly through its thick atmosphere. Now, that atmosphere isn't like Earth's atmosphere. It is rich in things like methane that aren't so good for breathing. It, because it's small, doesn't have as much gravity. And because it's cold, that methane is able to be a gas, a solid, and a liquid. And it turns out, if you're a little tiny world holding on to the triple point of methane, that methane is able to fill the, the niche that water fills here on Earth, where here on Earth we have snow, rain, humid days, and those liquid processes change the surface of our world, cutting out rivers, soaking into farmlands and changing the color of the soil. We see all these same processes on Titan. Someday there's going to be Titan meteorologists studying its seasons and its storms and that, well, not water cycle, but methane cycle. And the Cassini data is just the first hint of what we're going to see. So while I'm super looking forward to the Europa Clipper, well, I really hope that we do get a orbiter out to Neptune or Uranus and conquer that massive change in velocity that's required to orbit one of those distant ice giants. I also really hope that we send something to Titan 
to study just this moon and the fabulous environment it has that some have said hints at maybe even having life. So I, I am super excited about that discovery, but that's not all. Um, today, the science goes on and on and on. Uh, so the TESS Orbiting Observatory, which has had some of its mission goals curtailed by not having its sibling spacecraft, James Webb Space Telescope, on orbit with it, is finding ways to make do. And while studying the star HD1, H, sorry, HD21749, a, a star 53 light years away from our own solar system. Uh, it has been discovered that this star that is 80% the mass of our sun is able to host a world that is 23 times the mass of Earth and 2.7 times Earth's radius. This means this is a super high density world. Um, Thank you, Muga Fuga, for the follow. Um, so this is a super high-density world. It potentially has a substantial atmosphere, and it is yet another sub-Neptune-like world. Now, in looking at this system, they have also found that that sub-Neptune world also has a sibling that is similar in size to Earth. And this means that Tess has now discovered, um, well, its own similar to Earth-sized planet. Um, these are observations that it was, I have everything going off today. Sorry about that. Um, it is another one of these systems that has a Earth mass world, um, but it's not necessarily uh, a habitable world. This one is hotter. It's likely not going to have the same kind of atmosphere. Um, but this is the first time Tess has done this. And it was able to accomplish this by doing spectroscopy in partnership with Earth-based telescopes. And so we're seeing that the potential of TESS can still be realized, even without James Webb Space Telescope up there to accompany it. So here is to the little spacecraft that is showing it can figure out how to make everything go to get the science done. Now, to, to leave all of our planetary, asteroid, and moon discoveries behind, I have an artistic rendering of new research coming out of CERN that shows that light can do weirder things than we had previously thought. Now, it had been noted in some of CERN's experiments that sometimes it seems that photons, instead of interacting like the waves that they are, they sometimes interact like the particles that they also are, but not in ways that you would expect. Any of you who've ever played uh, some form of bouncing balls off of one another game, whether it be pool or bocce ball, know that you can predict how the ball that you're hitting is going to move based on the velocity of the ball that's doing the hitting. Uh, playing croquet, you can bounce your friend's ball out from near the wicket and get yours through if you get your angles just right. Photons don't do that. Photons are like, we're going to go wherever we please. And the problem is that the photons sometimes change identity in the process of interacting. Thank you, Svenska Data. Um, Svenska Data for the cheer. Thank you so much. I'm bereft of dogs right now. My dogs are at the groomers. Um, so uh, thank you. I have no cuteness to bring you today. Uh, so with these light collisions, what can happen is you have two photons. They come in and their waves interact 
And in the high points in the waves where there's a lot of energy, you can end up with particles, virtual particles forming, getting their own velocities and collisions on and then recreating the photons that are now going at completely random directions because of the additional interactions that take place. So what is to, to use the lowest common denominator of analogy, this isn't the best description ever, but this is the best way I've thought of to come up with it. It's as though you have two waves that come in transform into energy and particles. Those particles do a bunch of, well, a complete game of pool. We don't get to witness that game of pool. And what we see instead is particles flying off in new and unexpected directions. And thank you so much for that donation, Rocket Sage. Thank you so very much. So that is the science I have for today. Um, to run through it, we have a Kepler circumplanetary, we have a circumbinary planetary system of three worlds orbiting two stars. It's always good when your planets outnumber your stars. We have a new data release from Neo Wise showing that sometimes your resurrected spacecraft can do amazing science. We have science related to seasonal change on Titan, showing how even, well, lakes on a distant moon can undergo flooding and, well, drought. We have TESS finding its first Earth maths-like planet, and we have light, well, behaving oddly and awesomely, but not actually disobeying quantum mechanics. I am now going to take your questions, so please type them into the chat and remember to at me while you're at it. And uh, while you're at it, consider following us on YouTube. This is your reminder that if you ever miss an episode live, you can catch everything over on the CosmoQuest channel on YouTube. And uh, if you give us a sub, it really helps us out. So please give us a sub. It will induce zombies on this channel and zombies are always fun. Thank you so much, Rocket Sage. You know what it takes. Get those zombies running. And can we get a shout out to Rocket Sage? She's another one of the educational streamers here on Twitch and one of the founders of the Knowledge Fellowship, where I'm always going to figure out who to raid. Uh, she also does various, thank you, Trekker Kev. Uh, she also does various uh, video game streams and uh, all the cool stuff that you come to Twitch to see. So I'm now trying to figure out where my chat window went. There it is, I hope. Yes, there it is. Um, so uh, while you're typing those questions in, I'm going to remind all of you that we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. Your donations through the Planetary Science Institute are tax deductible where the law allows. And we are so very grateful because this is how we pay Annie. And we love Annie, and she brings you all the rocket launches. So please, thank you. Please and thank you. That's that's really all I've got. Um, okay, so thank you so much for all that you do. And now I'm going to do what I can to answer your questions. Uh Thank you, Puff Nudi, for the sub over on YouTube. Subs on YouTube are free. Thank you so much, Veronica Cure, for the bits. Um, looking to see what else is going on. Um, thank you, Ed Thomas, for the bits. Thank you so very much. I will have clean dogs to be cute on camera tomorrow. Uh, let's see what else is in here. Um, there's so many awesome new names that I'm not recognizing. 
Um, so, so Larry Weird and Proud, I think I answered your question. The, the reason that the asteroid appeared so red is they actually traced it out in Photoshop to make it, uh, more visible. Um, so the, the point of light that is the asteroid itself is in the very center of that blob of red, of red. So the blob of red is just Photoshop. I'm guessing Photoshop, it could be GIMP, it could be some other software, but the asteroid itself is just a white blob in the center of that. Okay, sorry, I moved my questions. Um, let's see what else is in here. Um, <laughs> so the, the green Titan that we're seeing is is just the the colors that they chose to process it in titan if you looked at it with your actual eyeballs and you weren't colorblind would appear to be a very orangey yellowy color um so i think the color that crayola calls golden yellow uh that's the color that you should expect for eyeballs but this is a combination of other wavelengths that were used to be able to penetrate through its super thick atmosphere and so this is totally a false color image um, but hey it got a science result so go green uh, I also went to Michigan State so I think I'm required by law to say go green for the rest of my life uh, or turn in my bachelor's in astrophysics Okay, so Hanny's Vorverp is saying, summer's indicated by tilt, right? Are the lakes raining themselves onto the southern hemisphere? So we haven't, that I know of, I could be wrong here, that I know of, we haven't seen lakes on the southern hemisphere. Um, but that could be a function of just the orbital alignment, the timing of the images. I don't know. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question, but the, the ones that we have seen before do appear to dry up and it is driven by tilt that we get these seasons. That is entirely correct. Um, so Rocket Sage is asking if I donate to PSI, does that go to you? Um, so the Tiltify, yes. If you donate to PSI through Tiltify, that does go to us. Um, if you donate directly to PSI through their website, you have to make a note in it that it's for CosmoQuest. Otherwise, it goes into the general fund, which is also worth giving to because that's how they pay for all the random stuff that makes working at PSI a pleasure. Um, so Larry Weird and, Weird and Proud asks, any idea how power how much power is required to maintain a suit at 20 Celsius on Titan? Um, I know you're not an engineer. Um, so it's more than I'm not an engineer. It's a, uh, I just don't know that number. So, uh, it's, it's a combination of the power needed to heat the suit, which is a straight wattage, as well as, um, how much power the suit itself loses through various processes. The reason that space heaters require so much power is they are transfer transforming power to heat directly and differences between different space heaters in their efficiency are simply related to how much power is lost in that process um and i just don't know so sorry um let's see um, so Larry Weird and P Proud is asking where to no donate to the April Stream Dreams. Uh, Streamlabs. So streamlabs.com slash CosmoQuestX. Let me type that into the chat. Um, so it is streamlabs.com slash CosmoQuestX. I'm going to check that link before I press go. Yes, that is exactly what it is. Um, there you go. Um, let's see what else. And yeah, the donate command has it. 
Um, thank you, Svenska Data. I still really hope that your username is related to the square kilometer array, and I'm sure that it's actually uh, related to music, but I want it to be related to square kilometer array. I really do. Um, Larry Weird and Proud says, does this weirdness include so-called coherent light? When the photons are colliding with each other. So if you shoot two laser beams directly at each other or at angles to one another, so the beams overlap, um, it is possible that the collisions of the photons in those two beams can have this kind of really weird scattering effect. Um, Dave Killians, your dog is a fabulous dog. I love dogs that like to be in laps. Um, so Strawberry Jesus asks, why uh, was it stated on the press conference re regarding the black hole photos that they don't have Sag A? Um, and it was on the media a bit, bit later, Sag A photos. So we have photos in other wavelengths of the center of our galaxy with Sag A star. So with work by folks like Andrea Getz, we have been able to watch the innermost stars in our galaxy orbit around that supermassive black hole. But we don't have any images that actually show the event horizon of our own supermassive black hole. So what they said during the press conference is using the event horizon telescope, the only image they had to show was the image of the event horizon of the massive galaxy's uh, M87's black hole. Now, even though M87 is more distant, because its black hole is significantly larger than our own black hole, its event horizon is very similar in size to what ours is as viewed from the planet Earth. Now, when we look at our own supermassive black hole, we're looking through all the dust, gas, stars, and other stuff and things between us and the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way, Sag A star. And they just haven't figured out how to clean up the image enough to share it with us yet. So we've only seen the Event Horizon Telescope image for M87, but we've seen other lower resolution, lower quality, different wavelength images of our own Milky Way galaxy's supermassive black hole. I hope that was clear enough. It's kind of a muddy thing to try and explain. So Nebula Cluster says, I keep hearing that Proxima Centauri B cannot support life due to the red dwarf star is blasting the planet with massive solar flares. Is it possible Proxima Centauri B has a powerful magnetic field to protect it? Um, at a certain point, if your magnetic field is powerful enough to protect you from those kinds of flares, it's probably going to do bad things itself. And as far as we know, you have to have a neutron star to have that kind of a magnetic field on that small of a scale. Uh, there's probably intermediate things that can do it, but nonetheless, planets are not on the list of things that can produce that strong and that small of a magnetic field. Now, all because that red dwarf star is angry at one point in time doesn't mean that at some point in the far future, life doesn't have the ability to evolve. It just means it has to wait. Our own planet um, has had a tremendously horrible past. It was well along the process of forming when it got smacked by an object roughly the size of Mars that led to a great splash where some of that former planet became the moon and some of it stayed behind to form our own planet Earth. It is low probability, but not zero probability, that there were extremophiles on that very molten, nasty, horrible, awful thing that was the proto-Earth. It probably did not happen. But life did go on to arise here in our world. It's possible that there could be the correct scenario where a baked, dry world has the ability to have an influx of comets, have an influx of things that bring it water or other liquids, and life forms later. Now, it's harder. It's not going to be as easy as 
allowing the great bombardment that is early in solar systems like ours to provide that water. But it's a big universe out there. And I can't tell you that that's the situation for Proxima Centauri. We can't know that, at least until our technology gets a whole lot better and a few generations have had a chance to go there and come back, uh, or at least send radio signals back. But um, who knows what is actually possible? The universe likes to find ways to be far more creative than the human mind tends to be. Uh, let's look and see what else is in here. Um, so Refs Matt says, scanning TESS exoplanets on the Zooniverse website, I found what looks like a close orbiting binary star signal. Turns out it was AV Doradus. I'll post the light curve on Discord. That's, that's cool. Um, oxidation. I, I, I need more words, Rocket Sage. I need more words. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Um, Astronomy Song uh, writes, As I understand it, summers on Titan are defined by the tilt of Saturn with respect to the sun, so the seasons are very long. Is that correct? Well, it's the tilt of both Saturn and Titan. It turns out that that moon, um, the entire system has a tilt, and as it goes around the sun, um, the tilt changes what is apparent changes and it turns out this is slightly green and slightly green screening uh so saturn seasons and titan seasons line up now titan does have extra complexities because of saturn's rings but it's seasons and saturn seasons line up which is cool which is cool um scrolling sorry to sniffle near the mic it means swedish computer okay svenska data um it's still sciencey so that's cool uh let's see what else is in here um so i'm opening your link strawberry jesus um i'm trying to open your link i have no clue where it just opened oh there it is So what you're looking at um, isn't the actual image from the, the Event Horizon Telescope in that video. Um, it, it's explaining what is possible with the process. It doesn't actually have the, the video of Sag A star. Yes, Fenska data. There is totally a Patreon for CosmoQuest. Go to patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX and you'll see the alert right here on the channel. They are linked. Um, thank you for the raid, Ben Science and Games. Thank you so much for the raid. Um, hello, Nicandria. Uh, so Ben is saying that he wants to go to Titan and it would be cool to live there. You would just need a heavy jacket and oxygen mask. You would need not just a heavy jacket, but like a full-fledged snowmobile suit and then a mask that goes over your face that also keeps your face warm. Um, yeah. I think we are doing well, Nicandria. It's a busy day here as well. Um, so yeah, that's today's science. Now I am going to need to go pick up my doggos from the groomers and make myself some lunch. But later today, I may be streaming as I work on making a variety of different graphics and doing some coding. Um, thank you, Nicandria. That's awesome. Um, yes, I will have clean doggos. Clean doggos is so very exciting. I cannot begin to explain it to you. It has been raining and we have a dog door and mistakes were made regarding not locking the dog door. And they have a lot of fur. 
Uh, so Ed Thompson writes, how much more different would an orbit around a binary star system be from a single star system? Would the difference in star mass cause eccentricities? Uh, it depends on how uh, far away you are and the mass ratios. If you can treat the center of mass of those two binary stars as a single point that you're orbiting, which you can do if uh, they are close enough and you are far enough away, uh, then essentially they act like a single star with very minor perturbations on top of that. Um, where it gets interesting is where you have a closer in orbit such that temperature variations uh, are a function of where the two stars are in their orbit, and it can lead to the orbit evolving more rapidly over time. All orbits are evolving due to perturbations. Even in our own solar system, we see in long-term models how Jupiter is able to perturb the orbits of other things in our solar systems. We can see the wander of Mars and Earth, but... Uh, in these systems that have two central stars, while you have a stable orbit, it does have a much faster evolution to its wander. Um, so Rocket Sage is asking, what is the atmosphere like on Titan? I missed you talking about it earlier. So it's basically a thick methane atmosphere. Uh, I, there's other stuff in it, but the methane is the one that really gives it its color. It has other complex carbon molecules in its atmosphere. And one of the things that's particularly amazing about this is that atmosphere, uh, the methane has to be constantly getting regenerated through some sort of a mechanism because methane gets broken down in ultraviolet light, like the light from our sun. So on Titan, there's some sort of a process, whether it be geophysics, whether it be biologic, or both, both is always an option, um, that is constantly replenishing that methane. And uh, methane serves the purpose that water serves here on Earth, where it's at that triple point where you can have uh, atmospheric methane, you can have rain, you can have snow, you can have ice. Uh, so Rocket Sage is asking, are the tectonics moving on Titan? Uh, we don't know so much if it has plates. Uh, it, it, we need to learn these things. We don't know yet. It's cool, though, because there are, like, river basins and things like that that we've seen on it. Okay, so this is what we know. And um, I am going to begin the process of awkwardly looking for somebody to uh, raid, because that's what we do around here. We raid people. And you are always welcome to give opinions. I'm going to check out the Knowledge Fellowship and see who I see streaming over there that is, sorry, I'm moving things around in unexpected directions. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, so Rocketology is live doing Kerbal Space Program. Uh, oh, bother is live. So do you guys want to go to Oh, bother? Thank you, Blumbodden, for the cheers. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So, uh, oh, Skylius is also live. So we have Skylius, we have Oh, bother, we have Rocketology. Let me know in the chat who it is you wish to raid. Uh, I will be back here tomorrow, same time, same channel. That is 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London time. Uh, we are, as always, a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. Your donations are what keep us going, and we are so grateful for everything that you do to support us. But if you can't donate or cheer, that's okay. The reason we want you here is so that you can learn. So thank you for being here, and thank you for be bringing your brain 
Science is the best brain food out there in my scientist having opinion. So thank you all and uh, looking to see, do we have preferences for the raids? Oh man, I'm not seeing you guys having opinions. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to oh bother with or without you. Okay, we shall go to oh bother. That is an opinion. Um, and raid is spelled differently from how I just tried to type it. So thank you all for everything that you do. And um, wherever in the world you may be, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And I'll see you on the other side. Bye-bye.